I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Campfire Talk. This is where we sit around the campfire, put our feet up with a cold drink, and let the conversation flow. Tom, would you like to make an announcement before we get started? Yes, I would. I want to thank our new Patreon members. Uh, welcome aboard. And uh, some people have wondered where they can see their names. We, uh, on YouTube, in the description, um, all the Patreon that we have, are, we give them a shout out in, in the uh, description. And so if you want to become, go to the next level and become a strategic partner with uh, Creek Devil, that helps us to help you. Uh, you can do that. You just go to patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil. Or if you're watching the show on YouTube, in the description, there's a link. You click it, and you just follow your nose. But all that aside, we want to hear from you. Uh, we'd like to hear your questions, your encounters. Um, so send those to questions at creekdevil.com. But the comments, absolutely comment away on the show, and uh, that helps us a bunch. Click the like and subscribe if we've, if we've done some something good that you enjoy and uh, and share it with friends so that's a long-winded way of <laughs> me handing the mic off to will you know you made a good point tom something we talked about on the last uh q a and that was about the hair color of these creatures and and you know i never really thought that much about it i mean i thought about different hair color because people always ask but didn't really think about the differentiation why you know sasquatches have different you know, there's a range, you know, black, brown, cinnamon brown, gray, white. Uh, you know, why there's that variation among these things, but not so much, let's say, among other primate species like chimps, gorillas, etc. You know, that's right. And that was something that was the obvious, you know, hiding in plain sight right there in front of us. Forrest brought that to our attention last week. And as the Brits would say, I was gobsmacked. I was but, like, you know, that's see, right. that's that's the one plus of having a, a qualified anthropologist on the panel is because she spots things the rest of us wouldn't or maybe not think about the glute muscles. That was a biggie. You know, when you look at the Patterson film, it's got a big backside. And that's why it's able to stand upright like we do. Same with humans. But now the hair I color no thing, idea. the hair color thing also. Uh, the another. fact that they, the fact that they're a primate, and yet they're also at the same time their own species, to have the different hair colors they do, like we do, that makes me wonder how how close their DNA actually is to ours. Well, you could back the train up on that too, and say, well, okay, if these are a really old species, the 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 other primates that existed that are extinct now. Was that a common thing among primates in ancient times? And maybe humans and these creatures are the only ones that have that variation today. What do you True. think, Forrest? Well, <clears throat> strangely enough, in, in the, the wilds, uh, <laughs> when you're dealing with uh, non-domesticated animals, animals in the wild, they all seem to have a, a commonality in color. Um, you know, your lions are all certain colors yeah you have you do have leucanism that shows up and albinism and stuff and um but uh, uh but it's it's rare um but um you and you do have that periodically show up in primates but it again it is rare but it seems to be fairly common and i don't know why i didn't think about it, it just occurred to me when i saw what i did I hear at the house, and I thought, well, that's weird. That's a, I haven't seen that color before here. Where did that come from? And it suddenly, I mean, like I said, I was sitting here watching true crime on TV, and then all of a sudden it just occurred to me, wait a minute, why does 
Bigfoot have a variety, a wide variety of colors, and you have that in humans, but you don't see that in other primates. So um, I'm not saying that I'm uh, Einstein, the Einstein of an anthropologist, because I certainly am not. But um, but you make good I, observations. I, I, why, well, yeah, I made observations, but the thing is, I'm wondering, why hadn't anybody else thought about this before? But um, I don't know. Maybe somebody thought about it, but they never uh, voiced the opinion. I don't know. But uh, anyway, you know me. I like to talk. So, um, Well, now, there's, but, a couple, um, there's a couple of things, though. I mean, number one, it must have had an advantage somewhere in, in, the, in their history of the species. Same with <laughs> us. And secondly... Um, I don't think a lot of people out there, it's kind of, it kind of highlights, um, the lack of in-depth thinking on this topic. You know, not that I've noticed it before. A lot of anthropologists don't want to get into it because they're afraid that it's going to damage their reputation. I mean, you know, I guess I've just always been one of those that frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a damn, but, uh, uh, you know. It, it doesn't hurt my feelings to, to say what I think. And <clears throat> it's kind of, I've always been of the opinion too bad if it hurts your feelings. But, um, uh, you know, I kind of go back to the convergent evolution. Um, you know, we, we are finding out now that uh, apes and monkeys actually uh, did show some evidence of bipedalism, uh, maybe not complete bipedal bipedalism, but uh, that they were evidently showing some uh, evidence of it in the fossil record. So, um, you know, it's been there. And so it does not, it's not hard to believe that Bigfoot as a great ape uh, could actually develop in that manner. And, you know, it's not unusual in, in the, with the theory of convergent evolution that they may exhibit different types of hair coloration as well. So uh, that's where I, I go back to. And then, like I always say, I could be totally wrong. And at uh, some point in time, when somebody, uh, you know, convinces me of otherwise, then I will say, hey, I was wrong. Yeah, I'll might, go with your idea. Yeah, it might, it might have been a much more common thing among primate species, you know, because we don't know. The, the fossil record is really incomplete. They do know that there were at least six or seven different ones that existed simultaneously at one point. And maybe that was a common thing among primates at that time period. And it's not today. Well, you do, yeah, you don't. I mean, the only genomes that they have really in, and we're we talking about humans, we know really <laughs> next to nothing about primate development as such uh, from the fossil record. They're just now starting to find a lot of fossils. And, and, a lot of it is up in Europe and the Middle East where they're finding these fossils. And it could be for the simple fact that uh, it's easier to, to preserve the fossil record in those areas rather than the, uh, the jungles because, you know, things just tend to deteriorate in the jungle quite rapidly. But, um, on, but with that to be said, um, you've got we don't know what the genome is on these things. You can't tell that by fo because fossils are basically bone that's turned to rock. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Neanderthals, uh, we've just now been able to uh, get develop a, a DNA structure for them, and they're working on it with the Denisovans. So, um, it's 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 not it's not an easy task so we're not going to get i don't think we're going to get anything from the fossil record as far as for monkeys and possibly apes and i think i told you all the, on the last show that they just they just discovered uh here recently a uh fossil chimp chimp for so, the first time i mean yeah for the first time now, up until that point they had absolutely no record uh for uh, chimpanzees nor gorillas that's so, why we talked about uh, that you know if those species would have gone extinct suddenly for whatever reason you know a couple hundred years, never known they existed. yeah a couple hundred years from now people would say well how do you know those existed well, well it was it wouldn't. discovered the the chimp fossil uh when were they no where oh, what, God, what you're was gonna the... let you... 
Oh no, that's what. No, 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 I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not putting you on the hot seat. That was just a. Oh yes, you are. uh, No, no. (laughs) It's a point of curiosity. Yeah, you are because you know I just read the article here uh, about two weeks ago, and I'll be honest with you, I uh, uh, I've forgotten. I think I want to say it was in in Tanzania, uh, Tanzania, or what? You know, they've changed the names of all those countries over there. I mean. I, I don't even know where half of these countries are now because they've given them all new names. I'm like, and I've never been to Africa and have no intention of going there, but, uh, um, okay. You know, I looked it up. I think it's, it was, Ken- it's Kenya's East African rift Valley. Okay. Well, that would make sense there. Okay. The rift Valley. Uh, well, we've, you know, the rift Valley has been where we've discovered actually, uh, a lot of the, uh, homonym fossils. So, uh, you know, Lucy was found there, and uh, it's it's just you know, it's it's a uh, hotbed for primates in that area, and I think it's because the of the the particular type of climate, and it's just been very conducive to uh, uh, preserving fossils. I mean, let's face it. I mean, you fall if you go a monkey goes and falls dead in the forest in the jungle. There are that body is decomposed and 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 jungles tend to be acidic in the soil and such and those 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 bones and and that uh, biological material is gone that's it's the same with the kind of forest we have here in the northern parts of the world i was just about to say yeah with very acidic um and, and so that's and nothing in north america and with weathering and the geology changes quickly over time well, yeah. Well, well, guess what, guys? Climates have been changing over time. So I know that we're just we're we're, we're kind of in that uh, people too many people are in that frame of mind thinking that oh my goodness, climate is changing. Guess what, folks? It's been doing it for eons of time. It didn't just start in the 20th century or the 19th century. So get over it. Uh, it's been changing for eons of time, and uh, you could have rainforest at one point in time in one area, and that's that's how we kind of come up with some of the fossils, and then it changes to a very dry climate, and uh, and a lot of times that preserves the fossils better. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I guess you'd have to have it, something that died and was covered quickly and in just the right conditions yeah. at the right time period. Oh, yeah, they find that with uh, dinosaurs all the time. It has to be covered very, fairly rapidly because, let's face it, if you got scavengers running around, they're going to see a dead dinosaur or a dead whatever, and they're going to go, oh, look, Dinner. uh, dinner's on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, and especially if that dead dinosaur is a T-Rex, and they go, him, never like that thing in the first place. This is my chance to get even here. And, hey, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> a big fat chicken. Did you guys see? Oh, I saw yeah. something not long ago. It's kind of off the topic of Bigfoot, but they were um, they were able to do studies tracing from chickens um, and connecting them to theropod dinosaurs, T. Rex, etc. That they're they're yeah. basically <laughs> uh, an offshoot of those species. Yeah, and we're well, all look at crows. You mammals know. are getting back. <laughs> right. That's right, getting back. Eating all those dang chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Barbecue chickens, yeah. <laughs> Throw a little well, I, lo- I love my chickens, but I, I hate to admit it, I like to eat chicken too, but I, I could never eat one of my own chickens. <laughs> I'd starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at some of the birds uh, of not that long ago there's the dodo that was one of them but there's another one i'm trying to think of the name of it it was a terror bird lived down in south america oh, in australia yeah and it was huge it could run 70 miles an hour all day long i think that's how it went didn't they say those died out like between 10 and thirty thousand years ago they're gone well actually i think i'm they glad they, they, i think they actually live longer than that because they're there seems to, if I remember correctly, I think that the, there was stories uh, within some of the primitive people down there that, you know, that were created, and they, they sounded a lot like that t- particular type of bird. I mean, I wouldn't let that thing, uh, 
I mean, they were huge, and they were vicious looking, and uh, I wouldn't want that thing running me down. Well, <laughs> when you look at the way birds eat, you can imagine something that big that would be, you know, kind of the same behavior. Oh, yeah. No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want my chicken that aggressive. Well, I think mm. these things would actually run down horses, and oh, then sure. one snap, they would snap their neck with their beak. That's well, they were not small, good. They were the small horses. They weren't the ones of today. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was a. It was something bigger than me, and it could just bite it and snap its neck. <laughs> that's, that's like well, you know, that's like a Sasquatch could run you down that quickly and snap your neck. So, I don't know. What do you want to be chased by, Bigfoot or a terror bird? <laughs> Well, I guess if they end it quickly, I guess you it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> if 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 death comes quickly, I guess it's that's the best way to you well, know yeah, to go. I mean, but we, we do, I, I really don't want to go anytime soon. <laughs> we we do hear about Bigfoot playing with its food before they kill it. So, oh dear, that's kind of like a cat. Mm. Well, you know, you're talking about the you know them chasing down. Uh, dawn what they call the dawn horse but you know that the horse is the only thing that we have a complete uh fossil record on strangely enough yeah one of my one of my professors in college that was her specialty was the uh the little horses when they first began and she was she was pretty sharp about all that stuff it was really interesting yeah they, they kind of look like tapers is what they look like yeah. and actually they yeah. say, i think the tapers might be related to the horse if i remember correctly you know it's interesting kind of off off track from that um I, I watched a lot of videos and i was watching one on chimps and they were showing a chimp these chimps group them apparently had killed another chimp and they were eating it uh and and what got what got me thinking was you know i thought well you know how tough you know hunting elk and deer and, and bear and stuff like that it growing up you know how hard it is and you know we butchered our own cattle and, and pigs and stuff how difficult it is for humans so I think we put ourselves, you know, to, to break those animals down, you know, even using tools. I mean, I remember one time we had a, a steer that was really big, and uh, they killed it, and my dad and his friends and gutted it and skinned it, and they had it hanging up, and they had to use a chainsaw to cut its spine. It was so thick. And I thought, well, how in the world would a Bigfoot be able to tear something like that apart? But then I watched these chimps, and they were, they, they one of them grabbed the dead one's arm and just ripped it off. I mean, like it was nothing like, like Tom, like we see the broken trees, it snapped that arm just like those trees are 90 degrees over and ripped it off and was eating it. And I thought, Holy cow. If chimps can do that, that easily, then these things obviously can do the same thing. You know, yeah, I feel like you get a for toothpick. It was, it was crazy. I mean, you know, it kind of brought it to home thinking about it. I would like to do a call out to any mechanical engineers out there on the braking strength of a typical dug fir or it could be a hardwood, you know, like a oak tree, three to four inches in diameter. What's the braking strength of that? How much effort is required to snap it over like that? It's because if you grab a, a dry broomstick, and try to snap it over. Good luck with that. And then you quadruple that. Well, you know, it's it, just not going to happen. It's kind of a side note. It makes me think about when we did last week's Bigfoot breakdown, and and they talked about it. You know, Jacko, only being you know what was it? I think it was under five feet tall, or around five feet tall, and one hundred twenty-seven pounds. So it wasn't real big, but it could grab a stick and twist it and break it. They said no way that a man could. And I, we've seen that in the forest so many times, you know, and I always think, holy cow. I mean, think of the strength it takes to do that. If it can do that to a tree, probably with very little effort, after watching the, the video about the chimps eating another chimp, I thought, man, that's, that's a tremendous amount of strength. Um, didn't TW have, a, have an account a number of years ago where there was a situation on Mount Rainier where a team had to go in and neutralize two Sasquatch and, and they, one got away, but they shot one. And I quote TW here as best I can. And Dumbo went over there to see if the one that they shot was still, was actually still alive or not. 
because uh, he thought it was dead. And in a nanosecond, it tore his arm off. Do you remember that story? Yeah, I remember it. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's just like, you know, the video of the chimps. They were just and, and and they were sitting there very casually eating this dead other dead chimp. Like I said, when when one was sitting down, it just grabbed the arm, the forearm, I believe it was, and just twisted it over really quick and ripped it right off. I thought, holy cow! I mean. When you think about the muscle and, and tendons and everything and the bone itself, that's pretty tough material, and especially with chimps because they're extremely strong and always using those muscles. And to be able to do it with that little, at least apparent effort, uh, was pretty amazing. Yeah, that connective tissue is very, very strong. So we see it with these creatures doing it to trees. We get people who have seen the creatures killing animals. You remember that we had the... Uh, I think was the guy in Texas they got surrounded they were deer hunting and then the creatures a group of creatures came up and they were killing all these deer or they weren't killing them they were hobbling them by breaking their their forelegs and then they came back he, after and collected them up yeah he was a 15 uh, year old kid they had a uh, pond some ways away from the back in the backyard and he would go out there in the evening and fish and that's where he saw that and, th and this thing would come up and it would just snap the legs <laughs> of the deer and it would be screaming in pain and terror, and then it would run off and do the next one, and you know I think the next one, um, yeah, boy oh boy. Well, look at the reports that we we've had with the the wild hogs with their heads being ripped off. I mean that that takes a lot of strength to do something like that. Yeah, we've actually got a picture that Joe and uh, uh, Walter took in East Texas of one. Well, they didn't, they didn't see the creature kill it, but they, they found this, and it was a big hog with the head completely gone. And it was dismembered without tools. Yeah, I mean, I mean it was, it no... was, the head was removed. And if, if you, anyone's out there, Trevor, tried to, or worked around butchering hogs, that's, that's tough. you got to cut that off. <laughs> it's not something you just yeah. snap off. And they don't just sit there and patiently wait for you to rip their head off. No. They're pretty vicious. <laughs> So I don't know what this, it'd be interesting to know what the story was behind that, but uh, it's Bigfoot one, hog zero, that's for sure. Well, and we talked to Randy in Canada, who was the moose hunter, and he actually, one of these creatures stalked and killed a moose right in front of him. Yep. Yeah, and that was, boy, that guy couldn't get into his truck quick enough. I, I would be right with him. He was thinking he might be next. So you remember he said how he, right. he tried to get out of the area, and he did, of course, but pretty pretty scary stuff if you think about it. Yeah, and you don't want that truck to have, have a situation like you guys did where you're sitting there trying to get the keys in, trying to get it started. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day, me and John and his brother Jeff. That was so funny. We think it's funny now because we survived it, but it was funny. Right. At the time, it wasn't so funny. <laughs> it, it just well, reminded me of that scene of the movie Poltergeist, you know, where they were trying to escape the house and they were trying to fumbling with the keys and everybody was in terror. That was us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's probably where they got the idea for that scene in the movie. <laughs> well, I think that's why, you know, when when the two two times that we've gone up to that area up here in Oregon, um, we combat park, you know, we because it's a dead end, you know, it goes up about a mile and then it just turns into a uh, trailhead turnaround. So we park the exit way. <laughs> well, you if have you to need think to, that way. you can leave quickly. Yeah, I, I've learned that the hard way over there is if you don't plan your escape and a quick escape, uh, you might not escape. So, you know, you want to think about how you're going to get out of a bad situation should it arise. Well, I think Wynn, you know, he's not with us anymore, but Wynn on the uh, Flathead Reservation had a situation like that where uh, he was like, he's on his radio, he's on his phone, come get mm -hmm. me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he, it was for him, it was like 200 yards. He went up a couple hundred yards. Turn around. He's like, "Oh man, I got to go back." And luckily, by that time, the thing was gone. But well, yeah, he drove uh, right by it. The creature was standing right next to the road he was on, and it was an "oh crap" moment. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember he, he called me right after that happened, or, or maybe as it was as it was happening. I said, "I think you need to get out of there quickly. You might be going into a trap." Right, right. And I think we've avoided traps a minimum of two times. There may have been a. Th- I think there was a third time. Right. Where we left in the nick of time. Well, it's one of those things, um, you know, when in doubt, get out. <laughs> and and right. I'm, I'm serious about that because, you know, a lot of times your gut feeling is the, exactly the right thing you're supposed to be doing. So uh, instead of trying to think it out, you know, you may, you may, there may be no indication something's going on. But if it just doesn't feel right, I would say leave the area just out of a safety concern. Totally. Because by the time you realize this is a bad, bad situation. It can be too late. Yep. Exactly. I think that's the sixth sense that kicks in with us. Just like my event that I had down there at the lake that, that night. I mean, I I knew we were in trouble if we didn't get out of there. And I think that happens to a lot of people who, who go out there and and are pretty, you know, they're pretty aware of their surroundings. And all of a sudden you get that feeling that, Hey, you need, you need to go. You're in trouble if you don't. And, and I think that happens a lot. It does. Well, I, I'm going to com- go ahead, Tom. Well, I just, I was going to comment on that. I'm still in a situation or I'm still in the mindset of, I don't understand the mechanism. Um, if they're going to come and get you, uh, if they're a predator and they're out to get you, why do they give you like a heads up? Hey, you're in big trouble. You know, where, where do you, know, this is just me kind of thinking aloud. You mean in, in terms of them doing something that might give you an, an indication that they're present or they don't want you there. You get a vibe. Yeah. Well, if exactly. they're going to let you know, here's the thing. It goes right back to what we talked about before. You know, any kind of an altercation in nature could become a death sentence quickly. You know, that's why predators go after the young, the old, weak, etc. They're not going after strong members of a species if they can help it, you know, for that exact reason. And I think with a lot of times yeah, as but... humans, you know, well, if you get a sixth sense, they're not, they're not letting you know they're present. That's just something you're, you're, you're picking up on, you know, and I still think it's, you're, you're picking up, you know, microscopic sense, you know, from the creatures that that's telling you hey there's there's something here that you don't want to be near yeah you're getting some sort of a premonition of danger and i just no i, I think i think it's physical i think that. i think we're actually picking up some kind of scent i mean that stuff goes out much more than we think it does you might not fit you might not consciously be aware of any kind of a smell but the particles are in the air oh like a pheromone or something yeah pheromones or or whatever <clears throat> You know, whatever, I mean, if you're in close proximation to one of these things, they're probably giving off just enough to where, you know, you're, because, and, you know, people are always saying, oh, well, you know, human sm- sense of smell is, is worthless, blah, blah, blah. They're always comparing us to dogs. When I took my neurobiology courses at WSU, they talked about that stuff. And they said that, you know, yes, be, a dog can pick up because they have that long snout and they have a lot more nerve endings that will pick up on minuscule particles. But the dog's brain can only identify, you know, a dozen or so specific scents, you know, that they'll know exactly what it is. A human can identify more than 50,000. Oh, yeah. Well, there was, there's the one time that my wife and I were at that spring that you and I were at, you know, the team was at, and there was one 50, I took a laser rangefinder later, it's exactly 51 yards in front of us. I just had a weird vibe. It wasn't that premonition of danger or we need to get out of there, but it was just a real sense of creepiness. But I didn't get the sense of we need to get out of here now. Well, here's. I think that's because I'm thick skulled or something. Well, I don't and know. then our hearing plays into that. How many times do we hear very minuscule noises? that the recorders all the time and there were things the recorders picked up that we didn't hear and yes, also you betcha and also it goes back to remember i, I mentioned i think on the q a we talked about I, I saw this on swamp people 
that show where they were talking about they were way back in an area where people hadn't been in many years and there was this particularly large alligator in there and the guys the hunters they were commenting about how silent it was back there and the fact that they knew that when there was a big predator in an area everything goes dead dead quiet so i think that's that's in us somewhere you know and because of our socialization and this you know created environment we've made around ourselves a lot of people don't aren't in touch with that but when you experience it it's still part of our being yeah well, well, wanna... guys, you remember you guys remember that you know <clears throat> very too long ago where we we took a video camera and uh, a drone fly over where i had my first encounter and <clears throat> we, we videotaped it and 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 all that and while we were there, a pumper showed up. And the pumper that showed up, the first thing he asked us when we when he came up to us was, "What are you guys doing? Looking for Bigfoot?" And and we were all like shocked that he would even say something like that. And he tells the story of when he was in the same location that I had been um, <clears throat> from my previous encounter there from a long time ago and had the same kind of experience that I did. And his words to us was, I had this feeling and sense that uh, I wasn't welcome there, and I had to leave. And he, he hurried up with his job and got out of there. It was, it was the same kind of sixth sense that, that I think people have sometimes when they, when they get into a situation like that. I think it's something that's ingrained in our, I don't know if it's in our DNA or what, but it's, or some kind of memory, just like other animals, all other animals, even insects, you know, when those big predators, they talk about them, big predators are in an area that everything knows and they just go silent. And I think it hits us too. We just don't want to recognize the fact that we have that also. Forrest, you've had that happen to you, haven't you, on the ranch where you've just, You've had a vibe because you've had more activity there than just about anywhere else, anybody else on the show. And uh, I, I thought I'd heard you say at times you just get this feeling. You know, I was going to ask her feeling. about that, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Jessica and I both have <clears throat> noticed that on occasion. And then, and then like, uh, when that night that we smell that smell, it was like, you know, it, it just, when we smelt it, it was like it hit us both just simultaneously. We need to get out of here, you know. And uh, I think that there's, just like y'all were talking about pheromones and stuff, I think that we do pick up on some pheromones. <clears throat> you know, primates don't have the greatest, and that that's pretty much universal amongst all of them. They don't necessarily have the greatest sense of smell, seriously. Um, but... Um, I think it's just something that uh, uh, that you know predators. <clears throat> of course, you got the big cats and canids and stuff like that that do uh, re rely a lot on on scent, and they're predators as well. But it seems that uh, we have this uh, beautiful stere stereoscopic uh, vision, and uh, we have we can see in colors and stuff. And that's a lot of your other. Uh, uh, predators don't have that, so I guess sometimes we've we've lost some senses and been and they've been replaced by others. So, um, but yeah, we've had that happen here, and it just it, it's just a kind of a a feeling that comes over you, like okay, we need to we need to get in the house, you know, and uh, and it's happened on several occasions. So, uh, and we've gotten where both of us know, you know, follow your instincts. So I'm not going to question it anymore. And how many times? Of I got to say, how many times Go have ahead. we heard it from people, Tom? Always, so many times. It's 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 right up there with. Uh, I think that's even more common than the uh, foul, noxious odor that people. You know, it's it's just part of the. Uh, it's, it's part of the the experience uh, with with Bigfoot is the the vibe that people get it just uh, you know it's very common i was going to ask forrest um 
you sent us a footprint the other day of somebody else in Texas. And I thought that was kind of encouraging in the sense that because for the longest time, it's like you cannot be the only person in Texas who's having or in your neck of the woods in Texas who's having this problem. And lo and behold, somebody else. Now, I forgot to ask you, did they send you the picture or how did you get that that picture of that footprint? Well, the gentleman that came over and did some fence repairs for me, um, we had talked to, I had told him not to stay out too late over there because uh, where he was at was over near, near the the stock tank and I didn't want him out there after dark. So <clears throat> I told him, I said, don't stay out here too late. And we told him why. And he was the one that, he was the one that, that, uh, uh, that picture had been sent to him. And, um, and it was by another guy that was doing fencing down in South Texas somewhere. I don't know the exact location. And I asked him if he knew, and he said he didn't, he said they didn't tell him, but that they had found that. And it, uh, I guess the gentlemen were Hispanic and they were quite, uh, it frightened them. (laughs) It frightened them a lot. So um, they were just like, uh, what kind of human has a foot this size? You know? (laughs) Well, the dimensions are wrong for a person because they're so wide, especially at the arch. It's almost like there's no arch. Yeah. There's nuts on the back. No, no. Well, I know that you know that, but but I don't think at that point in time I'm not sure they knew that. You know, uh, you can't expect a lot of people are might see tracks like that sometimes and think, oh, it's just a big person. So there may be a lot of prints that go unnoticed or unphotographed. Right. Well, I can I can tell you that people think oh, that's just a big person, but they don't they don't necessarily know the uh, qualifications that makes a Bigfoot print different from a human print well, you, so i mean the average person's gonna know that you remember my telling you guys <clears throat> back around oh, i don't know 2005 or so uh my brother-in-law and i were down in the bluff creek area and the reason we went down there was to basically look for tracks that was some project i was working on at the time and uh we were there for probably i don't know six seven days and one evening we stopped to, to get something to eat and uh, my brother-in-law says, well, now exactly what does a Bigfoot track look like? So I told him the dimensions we were looking for. And he says, you know, I think I saw some of those. And I said, where? Well, <laughs> near near the Carbon River in the Puget Sound area of Washington State, uh, they took out all the, or a lot of the railroad lines, the old ones, uh, and they put walking and bicycling trails there. I think there's like 126 miles of them currently. But... Uh, and I used to walk the one, and out near a place called South Prairie Creek uh, that I learned to fish in as a small boy, uh, he was riding his bike, and he saw this, he assumed a father with a couple of kids. They were kind of playing in an area that was off the trail. It was kind of muddy, and there was some water and stuff there. And he saw these footprints, and he assumed it was the man's footprints. And I said, well, as soon as we get back, I want you to take me out there and show me. So we went there, and sure enough, these were 14-inch footprints. They were Sasquatch tracks, and I found more than 100 prints there. And um, he says, "Wow, that's pretty big. I guess I guess that wasn't the man's track." <laughs> but it's easy to it would be easy to uh, misidentify something like that, especially if you're not really interested in the topic. You know, you give it a casual glance. You know, and what your brain does is, you know, whenever whenever something comes in front of you, you your brain's always answering whatever it is. You know, making sense of the world, right? So they see something like that, you know, two plus two equals human footprint. Okay, file that away. It's gone. Off to the next thing. Chuck, you ever have anybody mistake footprints for that were Sasquatch for human tracks? Uh, I can't remember anything like that. I, I do remember when right after, not long after I had my first sighting and encounter, uh, I started going on to a river area that a friend of mine, her, her family had a, a big, big, big piece of land there. And I was allowed to go out there and kind of look through that area. And, um, she, she told me a story of her, her dad and her were going out to check the cattle one, one day and they, 
they found a her dad or she saw this great big footprint at the gate where the gate was and she asked her dad what is that and he told he went over and with his boot and put dirt all over it and said oh it's nothing and I, I think her dad actually knew what it was when he saw it but you know he he just didn't want her to know what it was yeah, I, I think that happens more often than we know about. I know when we talked to Annabeth, who's uh, you know not not really all that far from Forest. Um, initially, I don't think that she thought those were Bigfoot tracks. And when we looked at the film footage, you know, because she went back for me and and videoed the tracks, and you know, looking at you know the foot her footprints and you know the Bigfoot tracks. The assumption was it was a juvenile. So, you know, the initial thinking was, okay, it's in human range size until Alan went there for us and he measured the tracks and did all the steps, stride calculations and all that stuff and counted the prints. And they were also 14-inch tracks, so they, they clearly were not human. And, the, and the, the shape and everything was wrong too. You know, I think a lot of people, when they see a track like that, uh, they dismiss it. Yeah. or being human track instead of a Bigfoot track. And, you know, if they if they actually knew a little bit more about the species and, and what these tracks look like, I, I think there'd be a whole lot more tracks out there that people would see, and and we'd, we'd find more tracks like that. Oh, I, I think, think you're right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like, my, like I said about my brother-in-law. You know, you get most people who either don't know anything about the topic or they're disinterested, and... They see something, it's a casual glance, you know, brain says, okay, human, off onto the next t- subject, and, and it's forgotten, you know. So, um, yeah, I think, I think you're exactly right. I think there would be a lot more out there if people, you know, maybe took a second glance at something and said, well, you know, that doesn't quite look right, or it's in the wrong place. You know, let's say it's, you know, you got well, I think a lot of... I was just saying. I, I think a lot of people dismiss it for the simple fact that they don't want to even ponder the idea that there's something really out there. Yeah, it um, can't be real. Because, you know, some of this land out here, you've got <clears throat> sandbars and everything else, and, and people don't put that into the situation. If they find a track like that, they don't they don't think about what's what's actually there, and they dismiss it instead of thinking, well, this could be something completely different. Yeah, I mean, you don't think about, well, okay, let's take a bare human foot. Is it going to be in that circumstance? I was going to use the example of snow. That's the first time I saw footprints as a kid when I was tw- uh, 14. You know, we saw footprints in the snow. And you have to think, okay, well, it's really cold. I think that day it was it was super cold that day. And you're thinking, okay, this is it's too big to be a human, really. It looks human. But it's this cold, and it's in snow, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. It just, you know, those kind of things don't add up. Think about the times when uh, tracks have been found, but then rangers have also found them, and they basically swept them over. Didn't that happen to you one time, Cuz? Oh, yeah. A line of tracks. Oh, yeah. Found, yeah, there was. And I the actually, rangers came out and raced it. Yeah, I got, I got a call from a couple old-timers. Uh, when I was living in Vancouver and I worked, I worked with the son of one of the guys and they, you know, he knew what I did. So apparently, you know, they were up scouting an area, uh, what they weren't supposed to be. It was in a gated off area by the forest service, but they, uh, they made Bajas out of VW bugs. And these two old retired guys, they were took off through the timber with this beetle. They'd converted into a Baja and, uh, and it was great. That thing would go anywhere. And they got back into the, um, system of roads back in there and this was north of goldendale washington and um that dirt on those roads was just like it was like flour it was so powdery and it was probably an inch or two thick in most places and they were you know they looked driving down the road slowly looking for deer tracks and they found these they were juvenile they said they were maybe four or five inch long footprints but they were clearly bipedal and and they knew they knew that it was it wasn't human up there, that it was probably a, a a very very young Bigfoot. 
So they, they found miles of these tracks. And on the way in, they talked to this young guy who was a, apparently a college, college student doing a summer job. They had a water truck up there. And um, I suppose in case, you know, there was any kind of a fire. But he was thinning trees out and stuff like that. So they talked to him for a bit before going into there. So when they, they came back out, and this was interesting, there was a Forest Service truck there, a guy in uniform, and he said he was a Forest Service supervisor. And he chatted with the two guys, and then they told him about these footprints they found. And he says, oh, where are they? So they told him how to find them. And they said he took what looked like a very expensive-looking camera uh, out of the back seat of his truck, and he said he was going to go take pictures and he told him he said and they actually gave him a card he said if you want copies of the pictures i take just give me a call in a couple weeks and you can have pictures so they went down um and contacted me and i took off from work and they took me back up there so we took the truck up there and it's it's a fair drive um you know you're talking probably half hour 45 minute drive one way and we got to where the Baja was, we got in that, we took off through the timber. So they had tied a rag around one tree on the right side of the road to mark where the beginning of the footprints were, where they first found them. And when we got there, there were no tracks. There was nothing. Now, prior to getting to that spot, there was all kinds of footprints. There were, I even photographed, I still have photographs of bear tracks in that, in that beautiful soil just to show uh, how good it was. And you could tell, you know, and I learned from fighting forest fire, and I've, you know, worked heavy equipment since then, and one of those things I've done is run a water truck. And you can spray with the water truck and pretty much wipe anything out that's in that kind of material. And I, I figured out that's what they had done. They'd gone through there and wiped out the footprints. And those two guys tried getting hold of that Forest Service supervisor and when he called the number, the number was legitimate, but there was no such person. You know, there was a similar incident back when I was down in the big thicket. There was a duck hunter that found a, a, a trail of tracks uh, going through the woods, and he reported it to the rangers. And it wasn't a couple hours later, uh, they had a bulldozer down there and just bulldozed all all over the tracks and got rid of the tracks. That's crazy. And I think, isn't it? I think a lot of that, yeah, it is crazy. And I, and I think a lot of that happens. It, it's, it's, they're, they're trying to, you know, cover up the trail. Now I remember Renee De Hinton telling me back, you know, when, when they were in the, in the Bluff Creek area in the sixties and the, the road crews up there would find tracks pretty often. And on one particular trip, and obviously the road crews aren't going to stop working um, they found some tracks. They called either John, probably John Green. So Green and DeHinden went down. And, you know, it, it takes a day or two to get down there. You know, if you're going from British Columbia, depending on, you know, how often they stop and when they get started and everything. Uh, Renee said that by the time they got there, of course, you know, the road crew, again, they weren't going to stop their work. They weren't going to cover up or protect any of the tracks. But he still said, um, you know, he looked at, they told him, they said, well, you know, the tracks had gone down the main road they were working on and then dropped off on this, I think, a spur road, he said. Um, so he went down there, Rene did, and followed these tracks. He counted 997 tracks in one day. And that's after the road crews had wiped out the majority of them. So, but in those days, they weren't doing it on purpose. It was just because they had a, you know, the contract to get the work done in a certain time period. But these other ones, what's the reason for doing it today, especially in places where they're not doing any work? I don't know. What do you guys think? I think they know is what I think. Somebody knows. Tom, what do you think? He's not muted. We lose Tom? No, he's there. <laughs> So Do I have to unmute first? I, did. I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> there was a button here blinking. Yeah, no, that's happened to us two times, you know, and, and I've gone into ranger stations. And I love the rangers. You know, I, I the, the Forest Service, they're great people. 
Um, and they've always expressed, remember last summer, they expressed a great interest in what we were doing. And, oh, hey, be sure and come in and let us know what's going on and all that sort of thing. Uh, you know, gosh, we had a guy here in May, and he, he even cast a track, and it was really big and all that. And I, I don't doubt that for a second. But we had that incident where something clanged on the side of the uh, excavator. And the next day, my brother went out there in just after Odark 30, and the excavators were gone, and the ground had all been... Uh, I mean, you can't really sweep that stuff, but it had been, I think they had taken the uh, Caterpillar with the uh, either the blade or the scoop. I don't remember oh, what it had. The front end loader that was parked there. Yeah, and just and leveled that whole ground so you couldn't see anything. Because there was a lot of spots that had some nice mud, you know, you know uh, that didn't have the uh, duff on it. The person I'd like to talk to is the person who found those tracks and cast one. Exactly. Didn't they say that it was exactly. just somebody casual that was a local up there, maybe? Yeah, 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 that's what it was, just some guy. And you know what I would love to see is cast some tracks, take all the notes about, you know, whatever you want, uh, you know, location or whatever you're comfortable with, and make a copy of it and bring it into the Forest Service and say, this is yours, you know, you can post it. I wonder if they would maybe... If they wouldn't, make, you know, take that extra step, no pun intended, <laughs> and mount it on the wall. Um, you know, I, I might. Know, they should. They really should because that would. I might bring who them. Who knows a, what kind of information they get. I might bring them a couple of casts next time I come through there. Copies. Yeah, copies. of course, copies. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, go out and, and make things like that. Uh, unfortunately, I've had people who. You know, I've been in contact with it, have made casts, and they're like, oh, yeah, we, you know, we, we talked about trading copies of casts, and I send them copies of what I have, and I never hear from them again. <laughs> you know? It was crickets. I remember that. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, that happens. You know, it's more about me, my own personal collection is what I collect. I'm not, you know, not showing them off or anything. It's just my own personal collection. But, um, you know, I don't mind sharing, but you know, it has to be reciprocal if you're going to share something. Especially when you say you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. But that's kind of the way things are with people. So, but it's interesting that you know people do find things, you do cast things. Now, why? I haven't heard of anything lately where anybody's covered anything up. That was um, that experience was in. Let me think. Would have been the early '90s, probably around '94. So, uh, that particular time. And you know, it's interesting. There was there was a parallel situation that happened just due south of Mount St. Helens right around that same time period. Uh, I took my field team I had at the time up to uh, a place called the Eagles Cliff Store and Campground. And when you're driving that highway up there, that's kind of the northernmost point where there's anybody at, kind of in the circuit I would make. And um, Kevin who was the owner of the store at the time, I, I stopped and I said, hey, you know, anything new? And he says, yeah. He says, you just missed a, a Forest Service biologist. I said, oh, what's going on? He says, well, some people, some locals up here, and he says, I know the, I know the people, they're very trustworthy, um, found a line of tracks up on this creek this morning. And this, he said, this biologist was going to go up there and take a look. So uh, we took off up there, you know, supposedly only you know, 30 minutes or so behind this guy. And uh, we got up there. There was no sign of this person, no vehicles or anything up there. And we split the team up. You know, one one team, one part of the team went downstream. The other went upstream. Both sides of the stream, we searched all over. No footprints anywhere. And so I went down to the, uh, the ranger station. And uh, some friends of mine, an older couple, they were... Uh, they lived up there in exchange for doing um, security, you know, for the Forest Service and their equipment and everything. And I asked them about it, and they said, well, let, let's call, let me call the Forest, the office up here, and we'll talk to the rangers and see if, who this person was. And they said, well, there had been no biologist. They, you know, there was nobody from their office that had gone up there. There was no biologist. Uh, if one, you know, anybody, they said anybody from outside the area would have to check in with them first. And he said there was nobody up there. So this biologist didn't exist. 
and this supervisor over in the eastern part, uh, I think that's over, I think that's Klickitat County. So east of Skamania County, that person didn't exist either. But yet there were two lines of footprints, both wiped out. Who was it that who was it that came by and I think they I think you were there cuz and they came in and you told them not to go and they went anyway. <laughs> oh no, that was that was a yak hold. <laughs> that okay. was hilarious. And for people who haven't heard that story, you know, the occult thing went on for nine months that we were there. And uh, there was stuff happening all the time and people seeing the creatures constantly. And, you know, we found tracks, we heard things. There was just lots and lots of stuff that went on there. So one night, right around dusk, uh, I met a couple of my uh, members of my group there. And we were just going to stay out. We were out on the road in front of the Gold Hammer home. And we were just going to monitor for a couple hours and see see what was going to happen that night. And we seen this car coming up from the town of Yagel coming our direction. And I thought, oh, that's, you know, somebody else who said they, they may come up. And it wasn't. It was this little blue Porsche. And this man and woman get out. And they had their little packs that they were putting on their backs. And they were going to head up the hill. And I told him, I said, I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And the guy says, oh, I, I'm a biologist. I, I know what I'm doing. And over the fence they went, up the hill into the dark. And I looked at my my friends, Don and Carol, and I said, well, they'll be back in about 20 minutes. <laughs> and sure enough, just like clockwork, you know, we stood around, we were listening and talking quietly. And we see these flashlights that were bobbing furiously as these two were just tearing down from this slope, uphill slope above us, uh, coming down through the timber. And, and they just about killed themselves getting over the barbed wire fence. Uh, the guy threw his pack over the woman she got over and fell down and and then they he gets in the in the Porsche and he fires it up. Her door is open. She's still halfway hanging out and then he peels around really quick and and they take off. And my friend Don, he looks at me and he chuckles, he says, Well, you call that one right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> so the creatures were coming down off that mountain in the evenings. You know, we'd hear them. Every time they'd usually be screaming and vocalizing and things. And, and these two went up there when they were coming down and apparently run into them and scared the heck out of them. And they never came back as far as I know. Yeah. It'd be interesting to, to interview those people and say, so what'd you guys run into up there? <laughs> You're in a big hurry to leave. And, and apparently you soiled yourselves very quickly. Right. <laughs> well, we're we've only got a couple of minutes left. Anything else, guys? You want to bring up? Well, the last thing, just something on my mind, was that so-called biologist for the Forest Service. How is it that they're going to have access to Forest Service vehicles, credentials, and all that kind of stuff? Not check in with the office, or ostensibly not check in with the office. And they just drive. Who are these guys that they can just drive in? Hey, be very amicable, get the information, and and then they have the authority to call in a truck to um, erase the prints. Well, just, you know, with the water truck, I think the guy was in uniform. Everything apparently looked legitimate. The guy with the water truck was just a summer temporary employee. He probably just saw the guy, you know, in uniform and badge and was told what to do. I'm sure he didn't. Oh yeah, sure exactly. I just, I just think the, you know, it just sounds like he's very, the, the guy with the badge was very nonchalant. Oh sure. And had the comfort and the authority to, to pull this off. I and mean, it's very interesting. Yeah, I know both those situations are very interesting. I haven't run across anything like that since, but yeah, it was very, uh, very interesting. And it, it was interesting. It was right at the same time period. I don't recall if it was, I, it may have been the same summer. I don't remember for sure, but it was pretty close. Well, does anyone have anything? We're just about out of time, folks. I'm just waiting for my stupid cough to go away. <laughs> That's always a plus. Yep. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap then. Um, thanks for joining us around the fire, everybody. If anybody wants to sit in with us and chat, you know, get a hold of us, and you're more than welcome to join us. So having said that, thanks for stopping by, folks. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.